hope you all had a good breakfast. Mm -hmm. We're talking about extinctions and food. And so if you haven't seen this book, it is, uh, it is first of all, a wonderful read. It'll tell you so many things you didn't know. And I felt fairly familiar with a lot of this territory, and it told me extraordinary things that I didn't know. You meet extraordinary people. So, I mean, the kind of basic question, really, for any author with a new book is, so how did this all begin? Uh, and there are, two, there are two parts to the to the answer because, it, in a sense, it begins 15 years ago when I started working on the food program on Radio 4, which is a weekly uh, program, um, a program that was uh, created in 1979 uh, during a huge period of change in in the in food world. Uh, and I was reporting on stories and traveling, lucky enough to, to do a bit of travel, and meeting people who seem to be spending so much of their energy wanting to save something that they believe was threatened or disappearing. <clears throat> and specifically, I traveled to Sicily for my first edition of the food program to record a program about the citrus harvest, which I thought would be a celebratory story of farmers gathering in the fruit and uh, but many of them were telling me it was the last harvest and that they were going to leave the fruit on the trees the following year <clears throat> because they just could no longer compete with a lot of the <clears throat> citrus that was being produced in other, in other countries. And I'd arrived and meet, met these farmers and, and it looked for them, these small-scale farmers in Sicily, that it was the end of, of 1,000 years of history when citrus cultivation had started on the island. And with that was culture, identity, work, income, um, and also flavors. Uh, so that um, trip also introduced me to people who traveled from the north of Italy to help raise the profile of these, this small-scale production of citrus. And they said that these oranges were going to be placed on something called the Ark of Taste, which I hadn't heard before. And it was the Noah's Ark of Taste, and it was a catalogue that they'd created so that people, wherever you were in the world, you could say, this is my food or my drink or uh, an animal breed, a variety of, of, of wheat, whatever, a type of cheese. And it could be placed in this catalogue so that the world would know that it was important in a particular part of the world, but also threatened. And I spent years looking through this catalogue, sometimes making programmes, and each of these stories was just a wonderful um, lens into food history, different cultures, traditions, um, and arguments of, as to why food diversity mattered. And now, um, 15 years on from that encounter with the Ark of Taste, there are more than 5,000 foods that have been placed into this catalogue from 100, more than 130 different countries. And when I was invited to write a book and naively said, yes, I can do that. <laughs> it, was the, it was the subject matter that, that I wanted to explore. And instead of thinking, well, I could just do a profile of each wonderful little story and its flavors and where does it come from and how is it used, I started to join the dots between these different disappearing uh, cultures, disappearing um, flavors, and understood that there was this bigger story to tell of what had unfolded around the world in the way we farm and the way we eat. <clears throat> and that became the book. That's, it's re so that was the kind of Bible, as it were, from which you started. And yes. that, that's part of um, another sort of small act, what began as a small act of resistance against food systems, which was the slow food movement. I think they were related, also Italian. So Yeah, in the 1990s, um, well, actually, the Ark of Taste was created in the 1990s. But a decade before, a, a, a jer campaigning journalist, Carlo Petrini, uh, who had been quite a, a radical uh, activist in the 70s, um, had set up the slow food movement in opposition to the arrival of fast food in Italy, most famously McDonald's in Rome. And one of the things that they wanted to do, as well as campaigning for better food and farming, that would be, um, I guess, resisting a lot of the homogenization around the world. One of the things they did want to do was to celebrate local traditions and local cultures, but to get beyond the idea that these are just quaint 
you know, little, yeah. um, you know, bits of history that are worth preserving because they're just, you know, interesting traditions. He believed and was convinced that they were far more important. And actually the connection between communities, their food, their history, the environment as well, health, uh, income, all of these things were interconnected. And so if you, in saving an endangered food, you actually, it was a social, economic and political act. Which is an argument, of course, that extends from food into, you know, the whole, the whole wider question. And I mean, I felt that, that your book, um, but also a lot of the things that I read are really about a reassessment of the 20th century mm. and the way we did things in the 20th century. So on the one hand, we have kind of notions of modernity, very efficient systems, you know, Fordism, you know, mm. runs through manufacturing, mm. but it also mm. runs, Fordism runs through uh, growing food, agriculture, the green revolution. Yep. And, and we thought this was very important progress mm. because we could feed a lot of poor people mm -hmm. and populations could grow and people, you felt that that was kind of the way the world worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a linear and in a way an extractive process. And that's mm. the, the question of limits and the mm. question of what was sacrificed in that process. Yeah. But we are still in a systemic argument uh, you know, with mm. with the, the 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 notion of small foods, the notion of small species variety, and the um, and the way those fit into biodiversity and what that what that means, versus the linear extractive efficiency mm. uh, delivery of of fast food. Yeah, I'm not sure we're winning. Mm. I think, but that's a great summary in the sense that none of this is part of a big strategy where we, we had a, 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 an end point in terms of what we wanted to create as a global food system and, and feed the world. And in a sense, it's, it's a sequence of events, which is what I try and tell in the book. So I, the book is, is based around the story of 40 or so specific foods in, in 10 different food groups. And, and it begins with hunter-gatherers and wild foods it goes into cereals so that we get that transition from hunter-gatherers into the domestication of, of grasses that give us wheat and barley and maize. And so there is, a, there is a sense of history that threads through these endangered foods. But absolutely right, that in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, when, the, when we start using the word genetics, for example, the first application of that really is in crop breeding. And so, you know, you had these centers of research in, in, in Britain, in America with the USDA, in Russia as well. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, you have people using this new knowledge to breed more efficient types of wheat particularly. And then with the Green Revolution after the Second World War, you had people like, such as Norman Borlaug who were using a lot of, the, of, of that science and the awareness of you know, crop, crop genetics to breed a type of wheat that was this dwarfed wheat was so successful. It begins in Mexico and then quickly spreads to India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and beyond. And then um, it's so high yielding that it just spreads around the world and you know, gets rid of huge amounts of genetic diversity. But importantly, Borlaug himself thought that this was a short-term fix, that the particular you know, acute risk of famine, starvation, particularly in in parts of Asia, uh, this was a fix, but it, couldn't, it wasn't a long-term solution. And also the important thing about the Green Revolution, it did rely on new genetics, but it also relied on huge amounts of water and enormous amounts of fossil fuels to generate, to, to produce the um, fertilizers that underpin this current system. And so here we are, where we have an energy crisis unfolding also a, a global food crisis, and what I'm trying to argue in the book is that a huge amount of the diversity, not only the genetic diversity, but the cultural diversity and the diversity of systems actually is far more resilient than this extremely fragile system that we've created, which seemed to be efficient, high yielding, really productive, but actually it's, it, it was successful for a relatively short amount of time. And as you mentioned, highly, highly extractive. Well, I can see the the vulnerability of monoculture. You know, you have 
one banana, one global banana. Uh, uh, so if, if a, a fungus attacks it or if, if, as it were, the coronavirus of bananas comes along, that's, that's obviously serious. Um, but if I'm a, you know, if I'm a, a Chinese official looking at uh, feeding one-fifth of the world's population, a population which is more affluent, which wants to eat more meat, and after all, you can't tell the Chinese they shouldn't eat as much meat as we do, or you know, good luck with that. Uh, you know, an aspirational culture with memories of starvation, of mass starvation relatively recent, you know, early 1960s, 30, 40 million people starved to death. Um, and, and, I, and my essential problem is, is, is volume, it's bulk, it's delivery to these people. You know, what, why would I be, as it were, sentimental about lost varieties? Mm. I, I see China as one of the fascinating um, countries to, to observe in terms of how much tradition there is, how much volatil- volatility there has been, in the, particularly in the 20th century, and then because of um, the economic boom, the rapid changes that have un- unfolded. Um, I think China is also fascinating because there are so many different Chinas. <laughs> and, also true. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, and also you, you see this reflected in, in, in policy as well because um, of all the countries that I was talking to scientists about what, you know, who's doing interesting things in terms of saving biodiversity. And so, uh, I mean, China is investing heavily in, in now preserving a lot of the crops that were disappearing, rice varieties, for example, because it, it now understands that, that that's a very uh, important resource to hold on to for the future. But also, I, th- I think if you look at some of the recent events in, in, in food production in China, so uh, particularly um, you know, 2017, 2018, the outbreak of um, African swine fever in the pig population which, because so much pork production is based in China, it decimated almost kind of 50% of the global pig population. And there were these horrific images of live pigs being um, dumped into, um, into pits to be covered up because of this disease was spreading because the um, Dense populations of pigs in these in these farming systems. But that so, was the first sign of that. Was actually pigs floating down a river, uh, which was a tributary river into Shanghai, and the Huangpu, and nobody knew where these pigs were coming from. And if you tried to find out, you got arrested. Yeah. So it's been very hard to actually get information out of China in terms of how many pigs actually were infected, and then it, it basically it spreads beyond Asia, into Vietnam, and uh, in, eventually into Europe. I mean, it's posing a risk. But So that, po- that poses a fundamental question of um, the genetic uniformity of the, of the global um, uh, pig population. So in the second half of the 20th century, as Borlaug did with wheat, huge amounts of genetic uniformity were created to, to create these fast-growing pigs high levels of, of you know, ability to d- feed conversion. So they grew very quickly on, on the minimal amounts of food and be able to be densely packed into these high production units. And I think this terrifying outbreak of disease uh, that had a huge impact on China's uh, meat supplies, it had to go into its reserves, it started to import um, genetics, you know, kind of new pigs uh, to re. Um, build the population um, from other parts of the world, which impact had a domino effect elsewhere. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I, I can see the, the, these two extremes, in a sense, that China's uh, a, a country that is highly depend on, dependent on importing huge amounts of food from elsewhere. Um, soy, for example, to feed those pigs. Soy fascinating story in a sense that it, the, you know, soy was domesticated thousands of years ago in China, and now it's in a position where it's importing most of its soy from America and from Brazil uh, as, as well. So, but again, this fragility in the system now because of this push for, for yields, and meanwhile, um, China's history of um, pork production, 
huge amounts of, of genetic diversity in the type of pigs that it had and really sophisticated systems as well in many of the rural parts of, of, of China. So, yeah, I mean, the tension is between saving biodiversity, the awareness of this fragility and risk of disease outbreaks, but at the same time having to feed a population of more than a, a billion people. Um, but I think, you know, that these monocultures and huge amounts of genetic uniformity, as informed, uh, we're now informed, you know, by that story of um, African swine fever. You mentioned the banana as well. Whichever crop you choose, wheat, maize, bananas, scientists are now grappling with the idea that um, disease is spreading more rapidly and they're having to breed more in new new um, varieties more quickly to contend with that. So we're in a race against nature that it looks unlikely that we will be able to win. Um, so it, you can keep changing the genetics and these varieties of highly productive industrial forms of food, but actually what I'm trying to argue in the book is we need a diversity of systems. And there are some systems that our ancestors relied on for thousands of years that with 21st century science will give us greater resilience, healthier food, uh, and reduce some of that risk of um, disease outbreak. And we haven't even mentioned pandemic and the, and the spillover effect, really, of this intensive production system um, and the risks that poses with, um, with pandemics. Yeah. Well, since we're on the horseman of the apocalypse kind <laughs> of vibe, I, um, mm. there is the pandemic, of yeah. course. Uh, and the question of the origins of the pandemic, mm. which also mm. relate to uh, encroachment on nature, and 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 uh, as as indeed with with previous versions of the virus, mm. but we're also we're also in a war in Europe, yeah. uh, which involves one of the major two of the major food producers, Russia and Ukraine, mm. and we have climate change. Mm. Now, if you look at this, you know, particular concatenation of events. Um, we're also in the middle of a mass extinction. Yours is the first book I read about mass extinction of food systems, but mm. mass extinction of species mm. is well underway. So without wishing to send everyone home truly depressed, uh, it's a very, it's a, we're in a very complicated uh, moment when things are interrelating mostly to the negative. So you mentioned the, the something which I think people pay a lot of lip service to, but, but, it's difficult to see it as a kind of tool of resistance. The idea that we should learn from, for example, rainforest dwellers or, or, or um, people who live who have lived with nature in different ways, who didn't join the 20th century, who have reserves of knowledge and understanding and a relationship with nature which is different. We pay a lot of lip service to that, yeah. frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always someone from those communities at a climate conference, but the but the machine trundles on. Mm -hmm. And how do you? In in real terms, how do you how do you take what those people know and what they understand and their and their relationship, and use it in a world of or which is going to be seven billion people mm. relatively soon? Because you know a small a small group of people in a large bit of rainforest is a very different ecological balance, yeah. a very different relationship. Mm. Mm. There is some doom in the book, but it's actually a book I I would argue is full of wonder as well. So I think there's a huge amount of celebration of uh, of you know traditional um, food systems knowledge, amazing uh, innovation by people who have come before us again as mentioned over thousands of years. Why is it that we eat these foods in different parts of the world? But yeah, on, onto that onto that um, question of how do we resolve some of this and what what is the relevance of some of these traditional food systems? One example um, from the book which might illustrate that is um, you know so here we are. Um, fertilizer prices have quadrupled in the last six months, so from 250 euro a ton to, to almost a thousand, around a thousand. Farmers are having to rethink how do they grow the crops that they've been growing when these um, price spikes have come up. A lot of the ingredients for these fertilizers come from places such as Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, so again, it's just revealed the fragility of the, um, the system. So what is the relevance of a tiny village in Oaxaca where they're growing a very bizarre type of maize? 
Let, let me just quickly tell the story. So in the late Oaxaca night... in Mexico, for those who... <laughs> yeah, yeah, Oaxaca in, in, in southern Mexico, which is actually close to the region where maize itself was domesticated around seven, 8,000 years ago. So in Oaxaca, there's a village uh, where the indigenous Mique people um, have survived in relatively inhospitable uh, soils and landscape for a very long time. And botanists arrived in one particular village in, in the late 70s and, and encountered the strangest looking plant that they'd ever seen. It was a, a type of maize that was, um, it was growing 16 feet tall and it had these strange aerial roots that were dripping mucus. And decades passed and they couldn't figure out what was going, this, this very bizarre looking plant. Um, and Three, but yeah, about three years ago, a paper was published by an American researcher who traveled and now had the new kind of te techniques to do the DNA testing of what was going on inside this plant. And it turns out the, the, this maize was releasing sugars to feed the bacteria in the, in the mucus, this dripping mucus, which in turn was fixing nitrogen from the air and fertilizing the plant. Now, we see that kind of relationship in legumes within the soil, but this was unheard of in a, in a cereal crop. And so what they're now doing is trying to figure out, is there something in the characteristics, the traits of this plant that might uh, become a, a, a more significant part in arable production around the world, which would reduce the amount of fertilizer you need to feed um, wheat, barley, maize, all those other crops that underpin the food system. Now, that, that kind of sounds like a one-off bizarre story. It turns out that at Kew, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, just outside of London, where some of the leading botanical work is happening, they, they have a herbarium where they've stored plants um, sent in from around the world to Kew in the 19th century. And what they're, the, the, the theory they're now exploring with rice production, rice is problematic for the future because of the amount of methane it yes. releases. In paddy, yeah. In, in the paddy system. What they, what they now think was that before we started to be, create a larger scale, more intensive of rice production, which does actually involve huge amounts of fertilizer as well, there was a soil microbiome that interacted with the rice in these traditional farming systems, where it meant that the, the rice was fertilized far more efficiently from the soil and possibly even from the air. So it's almost as if we talk a lot about the genetic diversity in these lost rare varieties of rice. Actually, what might have gone extinct is this microbial relationship between the rice and the, and the, and the bacteria in the soil that was part of an extremely complex system to, to feed the rice. And so uh, that's why some of, this, some of these traditional systems are so valuable because they might be the last opportunities we have to understand some of these complex systems of food production that were in far greater harmony with nature. But again, that's, mm. uh, that's a science where we're just at the beginning of that. I mean, I don't think I, I people didn't talk about microbiomes. They didn't mm. talk about our own gut biomes and the relationship mm. to health. There's a there's a an, uh, a a science that to, that we've really been oblivious about because we were so um, focused on the much more linear cause effect kind of we thought we mm. understood, mm. Um, and and not realizing what we were damaging or destroying. And you see it in it's the same in in for example the management of water where you know you think we'll build a big dam and then we can regulate the water and we can, you know, use it when we need it and we mm. can create energy. But you lose a river ecosystem when you do that, which yeah. may have much greater value overall mm. and, and certainly has a, a, a natural way of regulating flood and, and, and the pulse of, of, of the way a river behaves. Mm. But again, we, we are locked into systems which mm. value the dam and the energy and the engineering and that expertise. And we don't really have a way of valuing the riverine ecosystem, mm. particularly when it's going to cross borders and, you know, everyone's going to say their neighbor's stealing my water. So, so it's, it's systems thinking mm. as well. And in the food system, as you describe in your book, that is very well entrenched. Mm. Yeah, so uh, if you think that... Um, 
we have, well, we, we, we know of 7,000 edible plants in human history. We now depend on mostly nine, of which three or four provide more than 50% of the, of the world's calories. And they are part of a system in which the inputs required to grow those foods are in the control of a relatively small number of corporations. So with seeds, for example, that underpin most of this system, four corporations control more than 50% of the world's um, seed uh, development and trade. Uh, more than half, 50% of the world's cheeses are made with the starter cultures or enzymes produced by one company on the outskirts of Copenhagen. Um, one in four beers brewed around the world is the product of one big global brewer under lots of different brands, yeah. obviously. So there's been a huge amount of concentration. And I think those, just thinking about those seed companies after the Second World War, who then started to buy, no, it was chemical companies providing the inputs for the Green Revolution yeah. crops that then start to buy up the seed companies. And so you end up with this huge amount of consolidation also reflected in the animals that, the, that most of the, of the world consumes. So uh, the two most or three most important genetic lines of poultry in the world are owned by just two corporations. So again, but would, would we want to invest our, you know, if we're lucky to na- enough to have a pension, would you invest your pension in one company? You know, and I think that's the sense of that this, um, s- the structural issues that we now have in the system is that it's becoming inflexible and high levels of risk. 80% of vegetable oil produced in Ukraine or in that Black Sea region. And so we're seeing the impacts now spreading throughout the food system. Um, so, and, and this global system is also underpinned by huge amounts of subsidies as well. So almost a you know, billion um, dollars a year invested in, in keeping this system going. But that money could be used to create other systems of production. And if we could have this well, we did have a, a major shift in food production with the Green Revolution after the Second World War. If we can do it then, we can do it. Um, we, if we did it then, we can do it, do it again now with, uh, again, the new science, the new technologies. But um, it's also this idea that I think beyond food security, the importance of identity and culture as well, that do we want to live in a world in which we're all you know, at risk of wearing the same fashion brands, listening to the same music, eating the same food, whether it's appropriate to our cultures or even the environment in which we live. So I think um, the pressures have been building up in the system to the point now where we have no choice but to rethink the food system. Um, And I think it just needs a huge amount of diversity. It will be the case, as with this idea of multiple Chinas, that we do need to keep some of this intensive production in place. There is a huge amount of research underway in genome editing and also these alternative proteins. Question mark over what what role they will play in the future. But I think a more or a much better food system for the future will be one in which the foods I document in the book are not endangered, that those traditional systems can remain intact and can actually provide an inspiration to how we could produce food in the future. Because if they fed communities for thousands of years, there must be some value in them, is what I'm arguing. Absolutely. And actually, there are so many wonderful stories in the book. And one of my my favourites is the relationship between one of the last hunter-gatherer groups and and a bird. Mm. Do you want to to tell that story? Because it's a wonderful story. Yeah. And and this is the very first story in the book, in fact, because I do want to... I wanted to start, you know, in terms of our evolution as a species as well. So, I mean, in the book, there are multiple time frames, three and a half billion years in which you know, biodiversity starts to uh, evolve and then th- you know, 300,000 years of Homo sapiens. But um, the, I, I spent some time in Tanzania with the Hadza uh, near Lake Yassi, some of Africa's last hunter-gatherers, uh, thoroughly modern human beings who are opting to live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle in the 21st century. And their fav- number one favorite food is honey, and that, that, that takes you into this whole um, uh, area of research underway right now that it could be that honey was one of the th- key foods that made us human, made us who we are, but that the Hadza could spend hours and hours going from one tall tree, mostly baobab trees, to another looking for the bees nests and the honey. But uh, we think this could go back around 700,000 years when humans started to really have control over fire and, and use of smoke. <clears throat> that the Hadza will do a very particular whistle 
as the traveling through the savanna, that will attract the attention of a bird, the honey guide, scientific name indicator, indicator, wonderful scientific <laughs> name. Um, the, the bird will, the bird knows where the, the honey is. And so it will lead the, the hunter gatherer to the, to the specific tree. The hunter gatherer will go up with the smoke, get rid of the bees, still be stung quite, quite heavily, but uh, will then um, have access to this wonderful high energy food with wriggling larvae, crunchy bees, still, you know, still inside it, high, high energy, high protein, and will leave behind some of the wax from the nest, which is what the bird really wanted. Um, so it's a win-win. And this collaboration, yeah, we think almost a million years, but it could, be disappear, it could disappear in our lifetimes because the hats are, are under pressure from all sides. So, you know, there was uh, an attempt to, t you know, take them from the uh, hunter-gatherer, uh, the, the land in which they were hunter-gatherers, and, and force them into villages. Um, there is uh, the arrival of pastoralists who are being impacted by water shortages. So they're encroaching on land. There are um, commercial hunting ventures that have impacted on the Hadza's uh, landscape as well. So, um, and there's only 200 Hadza who actually practice no form of agriculture today. But this one million year long story could be could be disappearing in our in our lifetimes. And the, the last thing that I want you know worth keeping in mind with the Hadza then that. that their potential menu consists of 800 different plant and animal species. And uh, I traveled there with somebody who was studying the human gut microbiome, and he wanted to spend time with the Hadza to, to, to see if they had microbes in their guts that were extinct in ours. And his conclusion was that, that was the case. And obviously, um, very different uh, systems of use of medicines and elsewhere in Western uh, societies, but um, the Hadza do not have, they, they do not die of cancers or heart disease or obesity, or they have no food related diseases. And so is there something that we can learn from the way in which they are interacting with their landscape and consuming all of this diversity around them that we will not be able to replicate, but actually could be informed by increasing the diversity in our diets? And also when scientists look at bog bodies, thousands of years old, but the stomach is still intact, huge amounts of seed diversity that they find inside. So our story when it comes to food is one of huge diversity that we've narrowed down to the seeming uh, kind of this, this industrialized diversity that we, we now have. Um, and also huge amounts of genetic uniformity in the inputs into the system. Uh, meanwhile, the diversity that we seem to be enjoying is the same kind of diversity that's spreading around the world. So, you know, whether it's an avocado or, or, or salmon or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, we cannot go back to being hunter-gatherers, obviously, but actually we can be, in, I think, informed by their relationship with food and the level of diversity in their diets. I think it's such an important distinction between um, what we can learn and how we can apply it, because what we can mm. learn is fairly evident, I think. I mean, there, there's lots, there are still unknown unknowns, but we know, we know that. Um, but it's the application that's the, that's, mm. that is the challenge. Do you see any sign in the giant corporations, in the Monsantos and the Cargills, of, of not only the risk that they pose to us, but also the risk they run? Because, you know, mm. they're... They're also at risk. Yeah. Well, in the introduction, in the book's introduction, is a, it's a, a speech given by a CEO of one of the biggest dairy companies in the world, Danone, who was saying to the UN in New York at that time, we, we, are, we know we have a problem. In my industry, he was saying, this is Emmanuel Haber of Danone, we have a problem and we are killing diversity and we're, we're hitting a brick wall, really. And we know we need to change. And he was citing, you know, 95% of the um, American dairy uh, industry dependent on one breed of cattle, you know, the Holstein, um, which, again, was, you know, huge amounts of disease, issues of reproduction. We'd, you know, tripled the amount of milk it could produce in terms of litres, but it was, again, causing huge problems. And he was saying, we in the industry recognise we have a problem. 
Turns out that a year later, he was out of a job or actually had left Danone because the shareholders were worried that he was far more interested in saving the planet than he was in, 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 in adding value. However, um, Danone, interestingly, is starting to invest in, in small businesses. Mm. It could be that they are too big to pivot and make a huge change, but they, do, they are investing in companies on the periphery who will actually create more diversity in the food system. Right. There's another uh, company called um, Ecotone, now based in France, but 250 years old, was listed on the Dutch Stock Exchange, was a global food business, was a global food business, and then took the decision 20 years ago to start selling off a lot of its business and shrinking and focusing in on biodiversity, which it's now doing. It owns um, Clipper Tea, um, Calo, a few other brands as well, but big, they own big brands in Italy and France and, 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 and elsewhere. And again, there's a realization in, in that company that, that for the long term, the strategy needs to be different to what has gone before. It can't just be a race to the bottom because actually there would be too much fragility in that system. And then finally, the big money behind the scenes that we never get to hear about. So these investor networks that control literally trillions of, of dollars, they are moving money into areas of long-term production that they see as lower risk. So if you're an investor and you're thinking, if I invest in the cattle industry in the States, am I, are we going to be subject to some kind of lawsuit in 10 years' time because of a disease outbreak or, you know, as with the, the swine fever in, in the pig industry in China? You know, they're, they're identifying high levels of risk and the money is moving into interesting places of innovation and more regenerative types of agriculture. It's famously difficult to change corporate culture, but they can be outflanked, in other words. Well, you know, they're yeah. under huge pressure, yeah. and I think, whether it's uh, use of antibiotics, yeah. so that the investor networks have actually right. created some serious in, change. In meat production. In meat production. Um, uh, and, you know, and also Tesco in, in, in the UK has been under shareholder pressure to try and change um, the types of products that it's developing. One... The shareholders wanted to see a healthier range of foods. So, you know, there is a significant amount of change happening behind the scenes. Is it enough? Well, I think unless at the future COP event, you know, COP, COP next or COP this year in Egypt and beyond, unless we start to see a, a, a difference in the way the, these subsidies are allocated, um, we will be locked in. But we're, but we're running out of time in terms of, you know, when it comes to you know greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, um, water usage, public health budgets skyrocketing, type two diabetes, etc., everything is actually showing us we need the system needs to change. Well, on top of the war in Ukraine, we had the the heat spike in India, yeah. which the wheat planting season in India pretty much got burned out. So we are and they they stopped exporting yeah. as well. Interestingly, in India, uh, I mean, the legacy of empire is that they did produce so much wheat using the genetics from those scientists that I talked about at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. They are now re-examining millets as a future replacement to a lot of the wheat, mm. which is suffering from drought and also disease outbreaks. Millets were really highly nutritious, um, highly diverse crop. Uh, one of the problems was that um, it took a lot of labour for mostly women to 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 um, to mill to, yeah, <laughs> to 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 come process them. We now have modern milling technology, which means that the labour issue is no longer a problem. And when scientists have looked at well, what would happen if you did replace this wheat in India with millets in terms of water, micronutrient deficiency, soil health. Um, drought tolerance, it was millets won out every time. So, um, and they're going to change the PDS, the public distribution system, where, you know, put the poorest people in India get access to this food. Millets is going to go um, up the agenda to, to, so that's going to send a, a, a message to farmers to produce more right, millets. Right. Exactly. And it's a traditional yeah. food. Yeah, fantastic. Um, have we got, a, are we allowed to do questions? Excellent. Questions. Question in the front. We have direct experience here of monoculture. Mm. In the 1840s, we had the Absolutely. potato. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, how we cultivated the potatoes, we kept a few in a sack in the in the shed, if we had a shed, and we cut them into pieces and then planted them. So we ended up with a monoculture of potatoes. The lumper, then, yeah. And then... The famine. The famine. Phyto something or other infestens arrived and we our potato crops were obliterated. People starved. We had a population of 8 million before it and uh, we had a population of about four to three and a half to four million after it. Um, so we need, that was three generations ago here. Um, is there a risk of that happening again? A bit more, no? More than three generations. <laughs> mine. <laughs> well, you're obviously a very long-lived family. My, yeah. my, my, my um, <laughs> great-grandfather died in 1853. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, a potato blight's a really serious issue and you know, expected to become even more problematic with climate change. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a, it was a really you know, important event that unfolded, disastrous event that unfolded that, again, this lumper potato that was planted, genetically uniform, planted in the same soil year after year and the fungal disease, the blight, hit it, and, and obviously there are a lot of other issues around that kind of farming system. Um, and it was just a few decades later that um, Nikolai Vavilov, a Russian botanist, was growing up in Russia and by 1920 was convinced that actually avoiding exactly that situation meant that he was traveling across five continents to collect seeds because he believed that unless we had that diversity, we would see famine and you know, disastrous disease outbreaks again and again and again. And it's, it's 100 years after Vavilov was doing that work that the people are now, and governments, are really waking up to this. So huge amounts of... So, so it's, no, it's a really powerful lesson. Yeah. A lot of Dan's book is about the, the role of the crank and the outsider and the dissenting scientist and the, and the stubborn farmer, um, actually, also very valuable. There is an ecosystem of ideas we need to preserve. There was a lady in the front. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It's been so interesting. I just wanted to know if you have any recommendations as to us as consumers in our day-to-day -day lives, like when we go into the supermarket, like things that you, or things that you personally do or don't buy based on what you've learned. Mm, good question. Uh, possibly the most important question, yeah, what, what can we do? So I think, I mean, I, I, and everything is qualified by the fact that it's, it's, it can't just be down to us because of these big structural issues that, that underpin the system. Um, however, I mean, uh, there is a, <clears throat> a story in the book, um, which is just one example, well, uh, I think a really good example of um, uh, a, a farmer in China who I visited, who was growing, who was the last farmer in the, in the region, grow, say, clinging on to this one variety of, of rice that was, it was a red colored rice, which means that, that um, in the wild, rice is, is, is red, it has more nutrition, um, and a lot of his, a lot of the farmers around him were struggling with um, kind of weeds and pests and all these other things. He'd cre he'd kept this system going, but I was thinking, how on earth are you making any money? How are you selling this rice to market in the middle of nowhere? And then he took out his phone and showed me this app this called WeChat. Um, and he was selling this farmer in his seventies was selling his rice to people in Beng uh, Beijing and Chengdu and other cities. And I think that idea of technology can, does give us access to work and become the co-producers in a sense. With farmers, with other food producers, we can create alternative networks to help them save diversity. Yeah, so I, th I think that that's one approach, but I, I, I do think it's more, you know, in cities such as Copenhagen, for example, they've used public procurement of getting food into schools to support farmers saving diversity. So it's not a question of how cheap can you sell me the apple for? It's how many different varieties of apple can you supply to the schools? And that will be part of the, yeah, that's everything really. That's, that's educating kids, that's supporting farmers. That then there's been feedback, a feedback kind of loop to the growers, so the orchards are changing. So there's, yeah, lots that consumers can do, even more that cities can do. Uh, and then those structures need to, to change as well. Um, I wondered if you say anything about perennial food crops in your book, if you could explain something about that. 
it's the present situation. That... I don't touch on them specifically. I mean, I, I, interestingly, I think George Monbiot's new book, Regenesis, does talk a lot about annuals. And I think there's a huge amount of research going on to, um, to see if that can be scaled up and have high yielding perennial crops. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't talk particularly uh, about that. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a fascinating area of, of, of research. Are some yeah. of the tubers that you talk about, would they not be considered yeah, perennial? Yeah, or? so I, th- I think in, in terms of, um, you know, I, I travelled to Bolivia. My faltering botany here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the types of um, systems of uh, uh, perennial plants, I, 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 uh, there's, in the wild section of the book, I talk about the really sophisticated food systems uh, of um, Aboriginal Australians going back tens of thousands of years. And there's this yam daisy that they, they managed with the use of fire as well to clear landscapes to allow this plant to flourish, which did have a, a really nutritious, sweet-tasting root. Uh, and again, people are researching that now and trying to bring that um, plant back, which was decimated when Europeans arrived, introduced livestock to the landscape, and they just ate their way through this really complex food system that had kept people alive. So actually, there was huge amounts of um, uh, you know, population decline of, of Aboriginal Australians because of disease, because of violence, but also starvation because... European farming systems decimated these perennial plants. That they that was their go-to food. Uh, the Land Institute, for example, are doing a huge amount of research on perennial plants to see whether we can get get beyond the arable system of this annual planting and huge, you know, really intensive systems. But uh, you know, fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd, I'd like to endorse the, the philosophy behind the book. It's absolutely spot on. But I'd like also to remind everybody of catastrophes that can happen from time to time. And I have in mind uh, supervolcanoes. And there was a supervolcanic eruption uh, in Mount Tambora in 1815. And the population of the world in 1815 was less than a billion. Now it's approaching 8 billion very rapidly. But at that time, the dust which went right around the world actually caused famine in China and indeed in the North American continent. Now, if that happens with only a billion people, what is likely to happen with 8 billion people? It's mind-boggling. And our carryover from one year to the other is very approximately half a year old, which is desperately fragile. And we see the fragility with what that clown Putin is doing in... in, in um, Ukraine. I don't have to elaborate on that. Everybody knows that. It's just dreadful. We are in a very sensitive situation. And before I shut up, uh, I actually finished a book on this called The Global Imperatives. And one of them is desertification, uh, sorry, one of the uh, extinction and effectively overpopulation. We are overly successful. I don't want to raise controversial items, but This is something we need to address internationally. And one of the ways to do it, I would suggest, is way back, and I'm going back possibly 80 years, where the philosophy was that every country should support its own indigenous population by way of food. Now we have this nonsense of globalization, and we're lugging stuff around the world. It's fine to bring bananas from where bananas will grow to where bananas won't grow. We're not talking about bananas. We're talking about stupidities, for example. In the south of England, they grow beautiful apples, which have been exported to South Africa for polishing and packaging to be resent back into the UK for merchandising. Now, this is just crackpot. And lastly, I must say this, there was a program this morning about uh, farming in the UK. And in Wales, 0.1% of the Welsh land mass, of agricultural land mass, is used for vegetable production. 0.1%, way too low, does not support the indigenous population. About 1 or 1.5% 1. would. So I leave it at that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Uh, there was a lady further back. If you, if you think 
apple polishing in South Africa is mad. <laughs> you should look at the, at the, 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 fish, the fish industry. Mm. And we, we fly fish to China to be wrapped and we get it back in our supermarket. Hello, it's a very deep-voiced lady here. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's the hair. I, I, I beg your pardon. I, I, I get it a lot. Um, but I, I was just wondering how what you were saying about learning from sort of hunter-gatherer systems relates to the future of meat, which is obviously, as we're currently doing it, enormously unsustainable and ecologically um, disastrous. I mean, is, is, is the future that we should be sort of occasionally just reaching out? off a pigeon or you know what, what what's your what's your vision about that? well actually are you, the uh, national food strategy of england is going to be published in, uh, on monday and i think venison <laughs> is one of the things that's mentioned there but um to the story i would cite from the book that that informed me uh, uh you know about meat our future um relationship with meat it came from the faroe islands about a thousand years ago people settled they brought sheep, huge amounts of, of grass, not much else, so in terms of trees or other resources. And uh, they survived by using the unique um, conditions of that environment. They built these sheds with gaps in the walls, which allowed the salty sea air through, and they would hang mutton, which would be bathed in that air, and it would slowly ferment. And what relevance is that to, to your question? Well. What we, instead of having big quantities of fresh meat that need to be quickly consumed, what they ended up with was a, a preserved, fermented type of meat that would use almost like a garnish with other types of food. And they have great reverence for the livestock as well. So um, Faroe Islands means sheep islands. And so the economy and survival was very much geared around the animal, which they would allow to live to it was mature, so it became mutton rather than killing the animal when it, when it was very young. So in a sense, there was reverence, there was great skill and ingenuity in, in preserving something that was precious, and they would eat it in small amounts. What we've done because of the Green Revolution is to produce so much arable crops, arable crop that we feed that to animals. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that we really need to question is that, you know, producing edible food or food for humans to be fed to animals. There are systems and, and modeling that's been done about what would happen if you did have um, lower meat consumption, more emphasis on, on dairy. So for example, uh, production of cheese rather than huge amounts of, of meat and cattle fed on pasture. Uh, fertility cycle, uh, production of leather and you know other, other goods as well. Um, again, so it's, it's, it's almost become a, such a polarized um, issue in terms of you know meat and uh, plant-based diets. Whereas actually, I think um, redu reducing meat consumption and looking at more traditional systems of fertility cycles and the amount of meat we consumed informed by you know that practice on the Faroe Islands. So yeah, I don't think we need to be shooting pigeons, but I do think we need to be thinking about how is it that we in you know what kind of relationship we had with livestock for thousands and thousands of years rather than actually creating these, you know, uh, you know the, the, the type of breeds of, of animals that we now have with the modern chicken and the, and, and the Holsteins I mentioned. So, um, yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. It's a great book. And thank you as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.